Logging Apache Spark, because nothing is definitely as easy as it seems, uh, especially with this adapter. Um, so what are we going to talk about in the next 15 minutes? We're going to start off with a brief overview of Nielsen's data architecture, and we'll see how Spark really played a core component in it. Uh, we'll then talk about how we used to access and visualize our, and search our logs, and how it wasn't easy. Uh, a deep dive into the solution that actually provided us with log visibility, um, some main obstacles, because every solution has to have an obstacle, some pretty Kibana charts, and to top it all up, some future in adults. Uh, but first, the most important thing, who am I? So, who am I? I'm Simone, I'm 29 years old, I work as a big data engineer at ADOC. Um, I love data, I've been dealing with data for the past 10 years now, which feels like a lot. I love music, the weirder the better, and I love traveling. So, basically, this is me in a picture. I think the first thing that really pops out when you look at Nielsen's data architecture is Spark. So more than 50 terabytes, billions of events flow into this architecture daily, and they get deserialized, enriched, aggregated, and then eventually stored in all of these different data stores, all done by Spark. Um, and it would be very important to mention that at the time we were running Spark on what was, or probably still is, the most popular way to run Spark, which is Amazon EMR. Now, if you're not familiar with an EMR is, it just stands for Elastic MapReduce, um, and it's a cluster, right? So it's a bunch of servers running together. So it'll be safe to say that a big part of your job as a data engineer at Nielsen Israel uh, would be just developing and maintaining these big uh, Spark jobs and streaming applications. So I think before we actually start our discussion as to how we access logs, we should talk about when we access logs. And we access logs in one of two cases. So the first one would be when you just developed a new Spark application and you just want to follow it up as it runs there on Amazon. And then the second one would be when you have a production issue. And you might know that the problem is with Spark, or, or you don't, but essentially, you want to access your logs. And so, in both of these cases, time is an essence. So, how do we access logs when we run Spark on EMR? Well, the most straightforward way would be just SSHing to the server. Uh, Spark runs several components, right? We have the driver and we have the executors, and they, they spread out throughout the cluster. And so each one of these components outputs a log file. So if you choose this way, you actually have to pinpoint the server running the component whose log file you want to look at, SSH into that server, find the relevant log file, um, decompress it, search it, and then just hope that um, what you're looking for is there. Um, you do have a centralized way to access your logs, so you can access your logs through the Yarn UI. Um, just pick out your favorite web browser, log into the Yarn UI, and open up your logs. But the thing is, if we think back as to when we access our logs, then probably our application, in most cases, was already running for quite some time now. Um, and we have quite a lot of logs. So in most cases, if you choose this approach, your favorite web browser would just crash and die. And so at this point, you just have the last possible way of uh, how to access Spark logs when running on EMR, and that would be straight from S3. So Amazon do provide us with that possibility. They migrate the log files off of the EMR um, and into S3. But the problem with this solution is the fact that there's quite a lag between the moment that the logs are written to the server and the point that they reach S3. And we just wanted a solution that would provide us with log visibility, um, provide us with log search, and do that easy and quickly. Um, and for all of these reasons, we've decided to devise a solution that's entirely ba based on the ELK stack, um, with Beats really being the star of this architecture. Now, if you're not familiar with Beats, Beats are lightweight shippers. Um, they're open source, each one dedicated to a different type of data. So what are we going to do here today? Um, we're going to install our file beat on all of the, on all of the EC2 servers on our EMR. Uh, we're going to install file beat to collect log data. We're going to install metric beat as well, um, because if we're already there, why not install metric beat and just 
collect all of these metrics, all of that interesting information. From there, the data is going to reach Redis. It's going to be consumed from Redis using Logstash. We're going to index it in Elasticsearch. And then, of course, Kibana for, for visualization and search. So what we're going to do now is just really deep dive um, into the solution and mainly into the most complex component in it, which is the bootstrap action. So what are bootstrap actions? What you see on the screen uh, before you or on the side for me is just taken from Amazon's documentation. So bootstrap action is essentially a way for you to install additional software on the EMR. Um, and it will be very important to keep in mind that bootstrap actions run before all of the installations that Amazon provide with EMR. So I have here for you uh, a snap of our own bootstrap actions uh, that we had at Nielsen. And you can see that we are going to run a bash script which we're going to really dive into in the next following uh, couple of minutes. Uh, and then we're going to pass some configuration variables to them. And, and don't worry, we're going to deep dive into these configuration variables as well. So let's start. So the first thing that we need to do is just make sure that we're not running on the master node. If you're asking yourselves why, well, basically because Spark is not running on the master node. Uh, so no need to install FileBeat there. Amazon do provide us with that information. It just resides in the instance JSON file. Uh, so we can simply grep it, make sure we're not in the master node, and then keep going. OK, so check on that. Next, we're going to do is actually, yeah, just receive all of those configuration variables. And at this point, I'm going to split them into two groups. So the first group is going to be called for the future. And then the second group is going to be called for the legacy. What are for the future configuration variables? Uh, for the future is like anything that will enrich your logs and make the search in the future easy. So what do I mean by that? Things like team name and flow name, tags that you can add to your logs to make the search easy. Um, EMR cluster ID that you can actually just extract out of the, out of the EMR, uh, because that's also information um, that Amazon provides you. So what would be for the legacy variables? To understand the legacy variables, you actually have to talk about Nielsen's data department for a second. So at Nielsen Israel, happened what actually happens to a lot of organizations. We started off with one data team, and we grew to three data teams. Um, and so each one of these teams was using an entirely different lock for j file, and each one of them was developing their own Spark applications. And so we said, you know what? You don't have to change your lock for j file. That's fine. We'll just make the file beat um, installation custom made for you. You just need to configure it. Um, so for this, we have the configuration variables like line, log, leg, uh, sorry, like line regular expression um, and the log file name. So just make that installation as custom as possible. Cool. So now that we have all of our configuration variables, we're just going to wait for HDFS to be installed on server. Uh, why? Well, essentially because we are going to consume files that will be in HDFS. And so if FileBeat is up and running before we have HDFS, it's just going to crash. Um, and also, we do need JDK to be installed on, on our servers. Uh, so we're going to wait. And it's just a, it's, it's a, it's a simple way uh, to do that test. If, if you have a smarter solution, that's totally fine. But you just need to wait. Now that we're done with that, we're just going to download our RPM file, and now we're ready to actually configure our file beat. How are we going to do it? So I've created a YAML template file. You know, as all Elastic products are actually configurable with YAML files, we just need to edit that file. Um, and we are going to do it with a sed command, right? So the template file is just editable. So how would a file like that look like? exactly like this, right? So we're using ampersands in order to just edit it with sed. And so if I can draw your attention to the multi-line pattern variable, that's exactly one of these um, for the legacy, right? Just making that installation as custom as possible. And then if I can draw your attention to the EMR cluster ID, that would be just one of those for the future, right? Just make your logs um, more searchable. Um, cool. 
essentially the metric bit installation is exactly the same. Um, so with this, our solution is pretty much done. All of these products, um, they, they work out of the box together because they're all provided by Elastic, right? So your Logstash needs minimum configurations uh, because of the way that Filebeat and MetricBeat will provide that information. But I did say that we have an obstacle. So what would that obstacle be? So our main obstacle is definitely data engineers. And I think data engineers suffer from the same things that regular software engineers suffer from. And that would be like, all this good? Why I like SSHing to my servers. Why do I need to do all that work? Change is work. Um, but eventually, we did overcome that obstacle, and everyone saw the benefit um, in the new way to search logs. Um, so we were good to go. And now I have here for you just a simple visualization. Uh, so you can see that we had like over 30,000 log levels with warning and 23 with error. And this is really nice. This is really cool. I really like visualizations. I really like charts, right? But this is a real star for me. So if you can look at the, at the message box, right, at the message field circled in red, this was our, this was our goal. This is the log line. Everything else is a bonus. So if I can draw your attention to EMR cluster ID, that's the latest information relevant for your application running on Amazon. Um, you have all these tags that you can definitely search your logs with. Um, so this was the real star for me. And if we talk about the future for a second, uh, the first thing that we do is just replace Redis with Kafka. Uh, the reason for that is because as we were adding more applications and more services um, to this architecture, we were getting more data and Redis was becoming kind of a bottleneck um, and Kafka being more robust and persistent would really prove to be better in this architecture. And then the second thing is just adding more services, not even EMR based, but just EC2 based, right? Because essentially EMR is just a bunch of EC2 servers running together. And at Nielsen Israel, we were running a lot of products on EC2. We were running Druid and Kafka and Schema Registry, and you can just connect all of these with the same ease. Thank you.